Alrighty, so hi, my name's Christina. I run the adult programs here at Bloomingdale Library. Um, and I just wanna say thank you so much for joining us on Zoom. If you were also interested in coming into the library, we do have in-person events happening as well, including uh, this Wednesday, I thought it would be fun to watch the new um, Halle Berry film, Moonfall. <laughs> So science fiction adventure story by the director of, let's see, that Will Smith. Oh yeah, Independence Day. So if you enjoyed Independence Day, which I very much did when I was a teenager, um, come and watch Moonfall at the library this Wednesday at one o'clock. Um, and so you can come and do that in person. You can also come uh, the first week of October. On Tuesday, October 4th, we're going to have a local author here. His name is Joe Ziemba, and he is a a football historian. Um, and if you were excited by the most recent Bears game, um, a friend of mine at work, I don't follow football, but a friend of mine at work was very excited this weekend because the Bears won. But if you want to learn about the early history of the Chicago Bears, Joe Ziemba has a new book out called The Bears versus the Cardinals, The Forgotten History of the NFL's Oldest Teams. Um, again, that's Tuesday, October 4 at 7. He's going to be here in person with his books. So if you enjoy it and you'd like to purchase one, he'll also sign it for you. Um, but if you're a virtual uh, Zoomer and you want to stick with Zoom, we do still have some Zoom programs happening. Um, and we have a couple, including uh, one on Monday, October 10 at 630. It's about shipwrecks. So um, we have a guy joining us for the first uh, time, Cal Kothrati, and he is an underwater photographer. So his uh, presentation is going to be about the shipwrecks uh, in the Great Lakes. Um, so again, that is Monday, October 10 at 6.30. Um, and I do believe he's going to let us record that program, but keep it up on uh, the library's YouTube page for just a limited time. And you are in luck tonight because Michelle has allowed us to record her programs. And so we have those up on YouTube. So you can always catch this again later or share it with a friend. And then continuing on with our theme of uh, Lake Michigan on Tuesday, October 11, we have a retired librarian, Nancy McCulley here. She's gonna talk about Lake Michigan's lighthouses. So if you really love lighthouses, you wanna take a little trip around the lake, um, she's got all that info for you. Um, and then, like I said, we have on the same page happening in October. Um, and the book that we chose uh, for this year is um, Black Bottom Saints by Alice Randall, uh, which is about the life of an MC and all the famous, famous people that he knew uh, when he was coming up in Detroit in the 50s and 60s. So to uh, talk a little bit about Detroit, and the African American experience. We have uh, professors from the College of DuPage coming on Monday, October 24. This is an in person event, starts at seven, and they're going to discuss the rise and fall of the Detroit working class, um, which I think is a, a really interesting topic because Detroit has had many ups and downs through the years. So, again, if you want to learn more about the rise and fall of the Detroit working class, Monday, October 4, that's in person. And then we have another virtual presentation on the Green Book. And the Green Book was the um, originally called the Negro Traveler Green Book. So it helped African-Americans who were traveling the United States go to safe towns and safe hotels and restaurants and all that. Um, so again, that's a Zoom webinar, uh, Tuesday, October 25th at 6.30. Like I said before, we've got some afternoon movies happening as well. So if you just want to pop in the library on a Wednesday at one o'clock, every other Wednesday, we have a movie at the library. So you can check all of that out on our calendar. Uh, you can give us a call and register for programs um, either over the phone, in person, or online. All right. And now let me introduce our presenter of uh, tonight's topic, James Webb Space Telescope. Please welcome Michelle Nichols. Hi, Michelle. Hello. Um, it's so great to be with everyone. I know you're out there in, uh, virtually. Um, so it, thanks for, for coming and uh, spending some of your time with us. And um, by the way, side note, uh, I sent you an, an idea that I thought of of another book uh, separately in the chat. So there you go. Um, and uh, there's always books to read, right? But one thing I get asked sometime, uh, sometimes, or actually quite a bit, whenever I go to a library, someone says, oh, this topic was great. Is there, is there a book I can read about it? Well, that's the funny thing. This particular topic is so new that not only are there no books yet, <laughs> but this 
mission, this telescope, um, more than likely will help rewrite a bunch of astronomy books, or at least a bunch of topics within those astronomy books. Some stuff that we thought we knew we're going to learn a lot better. Some things that we didn't know before we, we may know a lot more about. So this has already been an amazing couple of months that the James Webb Space Telescope has been operating. And uh, we have much more to come. We could have this telescope operating for 20 years. And so uh, first thing I'm going to do when, uh, when we get started here is I'm going to talk a little bit about the history, just a little bit uh, of this telescope, and then a little bit about it. What, what is it looking at? What, what are we detecting? And then we're going to dive into some pictures. And in many cases, what I'm starting to be able to do is not only show you pictures from, say, Hubble, but also the Webb telescope has taken pictures of some similar things that Hubble has taken pictures of in the past 32 years. So there's a lot more of that to come. But it's really great that we already have things to compare side by side uh, and just learn even more about. But the thing that I really want everyone to take away from this, first off, you won't remember everything that I say, and that's totally okay. I'm going to give you probably way, way more information than you need. Um, my goal for this talk is inspiration. I will hopefully inspire you to want to learn more. Maybe go to NASA's website or the telescope's website and just maybe read a few things and, and keep up with it in the news. Um, but the thing that, uh, one thing I can't do a lot of, but that's kind of the neat part, is that I'm gonna show you pictures from the telescope, brand new stuff. Some stuff was only taken a couple of weeks ago, but I can't tell you everything there is to know about those pictures. And the reason is this information is coming out so quickly that the scientists are still themselves looking over these pictures and they are still figuring out what's going on. They're still finding the interesting things. There's still data being taken and, and mathematical calculations being done. We've got pretty pictures, but we don't have the encompassing NASA press release to go along with them. That usually takes half a year to a year uh, before you start seeing those. But these pictures, a lot of the data, most of the data, if not all of it, is, is publicly accessible. If you know where to go to get it, you can look at it. You can work with it. You can make your own pretty pictures out of it. That's the really amazing part. This information is so reachable, as in it's not totally being kept a secret and under wraps forever and ever and ever until everybody's ready to present to you the sanitized regular here's what you need to know about this picture it's wow what's this i don't know what that is boy that thing over there looks interesting and and we don't know what's going on in that picture we compare it to this and this and it looks like this but maybe not that's where we are right now so if you're expecting in-depth discussions of the science of every single picture even the scientists can't do that right now. That's the cool part. Why don't we get started? Um, and I'm going to share my screen. So give me just a second. All right. Let's get going. Okay. On April 25th, 1990, the Hubble Space Telescope was deployed into low Earth orbit and it was launched the day before aboard the Space Shuttle Discovery. And this telescope was the culmination of efforts that began in the 1960s to think about, design, then build, then launch a large telescope into space. And it was noted even as far back as, as the mid 40s in science papers that were being written at the time. Hey, science community, it would be really beneficial if you put your telescope up above the blurring effects of Earth's atmosphere. You wouldn't need a humongous telescope in order to do that. You just need a good one. And lo and behold, this telescope has actually done all that and more. And for the past 32 years, we've been getting some amazing results back from the, uh, from the Hubble Space Telescope. Now, development of a follow-on mission to Hubble started in the late 1980s before Hubble even got into space. And the design of this telescope really began in earnest in 1996. 
Now you're seeing an artist's rendition of the telescope and I'll just do a quick uh, intro to the telescope. I think you can see my cursor. The um, light comes in, bounces off the curved mirror. It doesn't look very curved, but it's curved kind of like a shaving mirror is. The light's collected by this huge area right here. And uh, this telescope, by the way, is 21 feet across. It's a big telescope. So um, uh, the light is collected. It bounces off a curved mirror right here, a smaller mirror that you're only seeing the backside of right here. And then the light is sent through a hole in the main mirror and the science instruments are back behind the mirror. This part right down here, this five layers um, is basically uh, a heat shield. And what this does is it allows the telescope itself to continuously point away from the sun. You need to do that because this telescope needs to be kept really, really cold. We'll talk more about that in just a second. Um, but this heat shield part is about the size of a tennis court. Um, the telescope itself is the largest space telescope we've, we've, ever, we've ever put up. So it is already a remarkable piece of equipment. Now, the telescope has four main areas of investigation. What are the four main things that they're going to look at? Number one, they're going to search for the light from the first stars and galaxies that formed in the universe after the Big Bang and study how galaxies evolve over time, how they change over time. Um, study how stars form and study how planets form around those stars. And then help us start to understand the different kinds of planets that are out there to maybe give us a sense of what the possibilities might be for life elsewhere in the universe. It took 25 years to design and build and test and break and test and break and test <laughs> and then finally launch the uh, the web telescope you you basically want to do all your testing on the ground to break stuff because once this thing gets into space you can't you can't fix it so um that's what all that testing is for um but taking 25 years when they originally thought it would take uh 11 years to get this thing off the ground meant we were able to add on to the science that it's going to study. Studying planets around other stars was not in the, the original mission goal for, for this telescope because we were just in infancy in terms of being able to study planets around other stars. The technology evolved and so they were able to add that to this telescope. Now, just to give you a sense of the size of the telescope, here's person over here on the left-hand side, Hubble, its mirror is here in the middle. Hubble's mirror is about eight feet across. And then here is the Webb telescope mirror in relation to Hubble and the person. So you can really get a sense of how big this thing really is. Um, the Webb telescope observes mostly light that your eyes can't see. So your eyes see a range of colors of light from purple to red. Purple and blue are the shortest wavelengths of light. Red is the longest wavelength that, that your eyes can see. Hubble detects mostly that light that your eyes can see. We call it visible light. It also can detect a little bit of ultraviolet. Your eyes can't see ultraviolet, but your skin can detect it as a suntan. Um, it can see a little bit of infrared. And infrared, your eyes can't see that either, but uh, your nerves can detect that as heat. Webb sees a little bit of red and orange light, so a tiny bit of light that your eyes can see, but mostly infrared. So it'll overlap a little bit with what Hubble can do, but it the, the range that it can study for that infrared light stretches farther into the infrared region than Hubble can do. Now, the, there is a really good reason for that. Um, First off, this, this telescope orbits far from the Earth. I mentioned this telescope has to be kept really cold. And that's so you can detect infrared light. Hubble orbits Earth only about 300 miles above our heads. And it is able to take pictures of distant things. But it can detect a little bit of infrared light, but not too much because I mentioned Hubble orbits Earth. Earth has heat, Earth warms nearby satellites. And so Hubble 
would essentially, if it's looking for too much infrared, it's going to just detect itself. It's going to detect its own heat. And so you wouldn't be able to find anything. Um, the Webb telescope orbits almost a million miles away from the Earth, so about a million miles farther out from the sun. That heat shield is big enough to block the light from the sun and the Earth, and it allows the telescope to be continuously in that shadow. It cools down to not too far above absolute zero. It stays super cold, and it can actually detect those infrared wavelengths that other telescopes like Hubble can't do. I almost don't even have to tell you what is in this picture, and it kind of doesn't matter. Look at the left-hand side picture, look at the middle picture, look at the right picture. The right-hand picture is the web region of this part of the sky. So each one of these telescopes was taking a picture of the same part of the sky. Compare how much better and how much more detail you get with the web image, the right-hand image, versus the other two. So the other two were earlier infrared telescopes, smaller, less resolution, less detail in those pictures. Um, but the web image, and this was just a test image. This wasn't even the, the totally final configuration of the telescope. And you already could see it was so much better than anything we had in the past. And in fact, we thought we were gonna get a level of detail in the pictures that we get from Hubble. So different wavelengths, similar detail. Turns out we're getting you might say even better resolution, better detail with Webb. This is already a remarkable instrument. Now I mentioned I'm gonna show you some Hubble images and some Webb images if I have images of, of those same objects. And so first I'm gonna start with Jupiter. It's, it's the largest planet in our solar system. It's very colorful. Those colorful colors um, are due to the chemistry in the clouds. We don't totally understand the chemistry that happens in Jupiter's clouds. You can see these cloud bands. We've got winds going in those light colored bands. The winds are going to the right. And in the red colored bands, the winds are going to the left. You've got round storms and stretched out clouds. And so you've got all sorts of really amazing stuff going on in this picture. And then we've got a web image. Um, in this case, uh, the brighter colored area, the brightness in this area indicates altitude. So the darker areas of this picture are showing warmer regions of Jupiter's clouds. So areas lower down uh, in altitude that are warmer. The white areas are reflecting a lot of sunlight. So you can see the great red spot right here. Um, doesn't look red in a, in a web image, but it is reflecting a lot of light from the sun. But what I wanna point out is the, the, the uh, splotches there on the, on the North Pole and at the South Pole. Those are auroras. Jupiter has northern and southern lights, and you can see those in these web images. We can't see them in visible light. We can see them in infrared light and ultraviolet light. So here we get to see them in uh, infrared light, which is pretty cool. Now this image was taken in 75 seconds. This is another version of Jupiter uh, with web. And what you see right away is something that was not visible in the visible light image, and that is Jupiter's rings. Jupiter's rings are thin and dark and dusty and just not visible from Earth. Um, it's just not possible for us to see them, but we can clearly see them in this web image. The other thing that you see is it almost looks like the image of Jupiter is kind of ghosted and it's not. That is a uh, part of Jupiter's air that's a little higher in altitude, a little farther away from the middle. This area right here is warmer than the clouds farther down. Uh, astronomers don't totally understand how that works. They think the auroras at the North and South Pole pump extra heat into Jupiter's upper air. And that seems to be what's causing that, that upper air to be warmer than the stuff farther down. Um, but we need, to, we need to study this some more, but this is the first time we've been able to see that global warmer layer farther up in Jupiter's air. 
Uh, over here on the left is Jupiter's moon Europa. It ref also reflects a lot of light from the sun. So that's why it appears super bright in this picture right here. Here we've got a Hubble image of Saturn. Now that Jupiter image I showed you before from Hubble, this Saturn image, I've got an image of Uranus and an image of Neptune. Those were all taken by Hubble about a year ago. So a year ago in September. Um, and, and Hubble does image the outer planets to help keep track of color changes and cloud changes and storm changes and all sorts of things. And so here we've got Saturn. Here we've got Uranus. We don't know a lot about Uranus and Neptune. Um, we've only had one spacecraft visit those two, and that was over 30 years ago. Um, here is, a, here is a, an image of Neptune. This was a Voyager 2 image. So Voyager 2 flew past Uranus and Neptune. This was a Hubble image, by the way. This is Uranus. This is Neptune. This is a Voyager 2 image. Now we've got a, um, a Hubble image of uh, Neptune. So this was taken again about a year ago. And we, we need to learn more about these outer planets and, and only having one spacecraft there actually pretty hampers us, uh, hampers us a lot uh, to be able to learn more. Um, so that is um, going to be a future goal of NASA to get another spacecraft out to hopefully visit Uranus um, sometime in the next few decades. But the blue color that you see is the result of red light um, in the planet's atmosphere being absorbed by methane. And so it reflects blue, scatters blue, uh, absorbs red. So those two planets both appear very blue. Here we've got a Voyager 2 image taken uh, in 1989 of Uranus, or sorry, Neptune's rings. And you can see the rings. You can see some dusty, uh, thin rings in the middle here. Well, lo and behold, taken about a week or so ago, we've got Neptune as seen by the Webb telescope. Um, and we've, we can, for the first time in over 30 years, we can see the rings completely. We can see those dusty areas that we just could not see before in any pictures from Earth. Um, so this already is a remarkable picture. And you've got the storms, some stormy areas in Neptune's atmosphere. These are high, cold clouds that reflect a lot of sunlight. So they appear very bright uh, in this Neptune picture as well. These dust bands, these dusty, thinner areas, we haven't seen those in, in over 30 years. So more to come with uh, Webb being able to image objects in our own solar system. Now, this is a picture taken from the ground here on Earth. Um, this is just taken, as far as I know, with just a regular camera. And this is an image of a constellation in the sky. We call this constellation Orion the Hunter. Here we've got his shoulder. This is Betelgeuse. This is another shoulder right here. We've got his belt and a sword and a knee and a knee. And you can take a look at the stars. You can see that they're different colors. Um, and Orion is... It kind of looks like what it what he's named for. It's a mighty hunter in the sky. You can kind of connect the dots and imagine that. But we're going to pay attention to this fuzzy bit right here. And when we first started pointing our telescopes at objects in the sky, um, some a lot of things looked like pinpoints. Those were stars. A lot of things looked fuzzy or cloud-like. And astronomers gave all those objects that looked cloudy the name the Latin word for cloud, which is nebula. So you'll hear that name nebula attached to lots of different kinds of objects in the sky. We still use the word nebula. It still refers to something that's cloudy or fuzzy looking, um, but there's lots of different things that are called nebula. So same word is used just to describe really how something looks, not really telling you a lot about it. Um, this is that cloudy, fuzzy region in Orion. This is the cloudy thing in the direction of the constellation Orion called the Orion Nebula. And uh, what you've got is lots of gas and dust. The gas is mostly hydrogen with some other gas in there too. The dark stuff that looks like wispy dark stuff, that is um, dust. And think dust like smoke particle size stuff. And what is lighting up this whole thing, there's four stars right in the middle here. And those four stars 
are very hot, very bright, and they're essentially causing this whole cloud to glow, kind of like a fluorescent light bulb. Well, this is a Hubble image of the Orion Nebula. The next slide is also a Hubble image. Um, it'll take a second for it to come up. There it is. And in this Hubble image, they've highlighted five or six different objects here. What you have are stars. So each one of these is showing where there is a star. Each of those stars is surrounded by dusty, wispy stuff. And that dusty, wispy stuff around those stars, you're seeing the beginnings of stars, the very beginnings of a solar system around each of those stars. Now, planets have not formed. It's too early for that. But you're seeing the earliest stages of what a solar system looks like after the star has formed, but before the planets start forming, before stuff starts sticking together enough to be able to form planets. If you wanna get a sense of what our early solar system looked like before the planets were here, it was probably something that looked a bunch like this. So by using Hubble, we've been able to uh, really get a good sense of what the entire life cycle of stars is like. And all stars start off in the same way, they all start off in big giant clouds of gas and dust. Our sun likely formed in a big cloud, just like this one. Well, I'm gonna go back to that prior picture and we're gonna highlight this region right here. And that region here is this brand new web image that was taken uh, about a week and a half or so ago, about two weeks ago, sorry. This is a portion of the Orion Nebula. And what we're seeing if, you, if I go back to the prior picture, you can see lots of gas and dust and stuff here, but not a lot of stars. If I go to this picture, you can see a lot more stars. They pop into view because the dust is transparent to infrared light. The, the infrared light can pass through the dust, allowing us to see a lot more that we could not see before. And that's something that is uh, that was that Hubble is, is kind of blind to is if you've got a star, it has formed, but it is totally surrounded in dust, you're not going to see it using Hubble. You are going to see it using Webb. So those earliest stages of how stars form, we're going to learn a lot more about that with the Webb telescope. And so this is an image just beginning to help us see um, what's going on in this part of the Orion Nebula. This is a different nebula. It's called the Carina Nebula. And this picture was taken from uh, Namibia, which is a country in Africa, very dark skies where this picture was taken. And we are going to focus our attention on this little bit of it right up here. Um, and so let's go to a Hubble image of that region. So it's turned on its side. Um, so this is a portion of the Carina Nebula. And this was um, a, a great picture showing, again, gas, dust, um, off the edge of the picture are some bright stars that are lighting up all this gas and dust. And the light and the heat from the stars is pushing against this dust. Imagine you've got a, a person pushing against a big bubble and that push, person is pushing and it, pushing it. Well, that's what's going on with this, uh, with these stars here. The light and the heat from the stars is going out and running into this stuff right here, shoving it farther and farther away. Well, that's the Hubble image. And this is the picture I use in my title slide. This is the web image. And you already, you don't even have to really know what's going on in this picture. You just know you can see more stuff. You can see more detail, detail that we couldn't get um, in, the, in the Hubble image. We just didn't have the resolution to see this detail. And what they're just starting to be able to study is some of the structures in this dust that weren't visible before. And again, this is a great example of this picture is so new that the press releases have not been written about it, that we know what's going on here from the Hubble image, but we need to know more about what's going on here and what the, what the web uh, data is telling us about these very early stars within this cloud of gas and dust. This is called the Tarantula Nebula. I'm not sure which part is supposed to be the Tarantula. Um, it may just be too zoomed in to be able to uh, 
to know, but this is this is a Hubble image of the Tarantula Nebula. So maybe if you zoom farther out, maybe it looks something like a tarantula, but I don't see the tarantula. So if, if you don't, that's okay, I don't either. Um, we are going to focus our attention on this part right here. And what you'll see in the Hubble image is just the barest suggestion that there's some stars right in here. Well, if we go to the web version that was taken a few weeks ago, now you really see them. And again, stars form in big giant clouds of gas and dust. Stars form in big giant groups. Our sun likely formed in a group just like this. Our sun very likely formed with, with, a, with material around it that eventually became the planets and that stuff stuck together. So you're seeing the earlier stages of something that we weren't around to see five billion years ago. So by studying all these different examples of where different stars are in their life cycle, we get to piece together the entire history of how stars form and live their lives and end. Because humans don't last long enough to see that with one star from start to finish. So putting it all together with all these different examples is really important to do. Now this is a really interesting star. Um, I believe, I believe this is a Hubble image. Um, I'm looking, yeah, I'm pretty sure this is a Hubble image. This is a, a star that is nearing the end of its lifetime. Um, stars near the end, uh, stars that are the same size as our sun, when they near the end of their lifetimes, they start puffing off layers of themselves into space. They don't explode but they gently puff layers off. This star has puffed off layers of a, a material that you'll recognize the name of and it's carbon. Why am I showing you this? Well, this is where carbon on earth came from. This is where the carbon that makes up life on earth came from, from a star or more than one long ago that puffed off its outer carbon layers into space. And that stuff got mixed into the cloud of gas and dust that eventually formed our sun and our solar system. So the carbon that you are made of was formed in a distant long ago star, which is really kind of neat to think of if you ask me. Um, by the way, I'll point this out. I, I, I normally forget to, to talk about this because I normally don't have a glass of water next to me. Um, but if you happen to have a glass of water near you, uh, just take a look at it and marvel at the fact that the oxygen in the H2O that you're drinking was also made inside a star. But the hydrogen in the H2O, the hydrogen in all these stars, the hydrogen in this water, the hydrogen in the gas clouds, everything that I'm showing you that has hydrogen in it, that hydrogen was made in the Big Bang itself. The hydrogen from, the, from everything that you're used to that has hydrogen in it is a result of the Big Bang itself. I'll let that melt your brain cells for a little while. All right, let's move on. This is an object uh, photographed by Hubble. This is called the Southern Ring Nebula. Again, nebula, fuzzy thing and ring because kind of looks like a ring, kind of a squashed ring. Um, but this is an example of a star that has neared the end of its lifetime. It has puffed off its outer layers into space. And what's left over is what used to be at the center of the star. And that's its area right in here. So this all used to be attached to the middle. And again, this is going to happen to our sun in about 5 billion years. So we, in some examples, pictures before I got to see what our sun was like a long time ago, we now get to see what the future holds for our sun, all by studying these other objects. But here's the web image. And this is uh, one version of the web image, an amazing amount of detail, and you can see even more of that stuff that got puffed off into space. But we also have another picture of this, and this is a, a, a slightly different wavelength range of infrared. And what pops into view, I'm going to go back and forth, what pops into view, there's actually two stars there. You see that? We've got this 
brighter one and this one right here. And hidden from view is that second star that has never before been seen. Um, this brighter star is the uh, is younger than this other one. This other one was the one that puffed off itself into space. And the same thing is going to happen to that other star sometime in the future. So this will have a couple of bubbles worth of, uh, of stuff. So pretty neat to see. There's also something that that the scientists want to make sure everybody pays attention to, including other scientists. Don't just look at what the picture is of. Look in the background, because web images are going to give us surprises probably in every single image that we get. Stuff in, that just happens to be in the background that isn't necessarily the focus of, of taking the picture, but you're going to see this other stuff. And in this case, this thing right here is this object right here. This is a far distant galaxy. And just to explain, we live in a solar system. Our solar system is made of one star and the planets and other stuff that goes around the sun. And then our solar system is part of a much larger collection of stars, about 400 billion in all called the Milky Way galaxy. Our galaxy is a, is a pinwheel or a spiral shape. This is a pinwheel shaped galaxy, but seen on its edge. So if you ever, if you have a pinwheel around the house um, and you blow it and you, you know the pinwheel goes around and around, look at a pinwheel on its edge and a pinwheel looks very flat. And so that's what this is right here. So scientists interested in galaxies are gonna wanna study this guy right here because you can see um, this particular galaxy really well. And it just happens to be in the background of this picture. That's going to happen a lot in web images now and in the future. Webb has taken a picture of a planet around another star. Now, again, this is not the first time that a picture has been taken of a planet around another star. The fact that we can take a picture, that's the cool part. That's the thing that, that uh, we look forward to even more in the future. Now, the planet is the blob in the middle. These two left-hand pictures, these kind of arc shapes, those are artifacts of processing the images. Those are not real. The, the planet itself is the little blob in the middle. But expect much, much more to come from Webb studying planets around other stars. This is where this telescope will really give us some amazing data because planets show up really nicely using infrared light. So we look forward to a lot more data coming from uh, these planets and others. Now, this is a Hubble image. This is a galaxy. This is a pinwheel shape. So I showed you a pinwheel shaped one from the side. This is a pinwheel shaped one seen face on. And it is pinwheel or spiral, either one. You could use either name. Um, when you think spiral galaxy. This is what a lot of people think of um, for this particular shape here. Now there was another infrared telescope, a prior one, that took a picture of this galaxy. And what you see is, is stuff that was hidden with all the dust. So what you're seeing here is you're not really seeing individual stars. You're seeing groups of stars and they are uh, that's what the lighter stuff is in this picture. Then the darker stuff is dust but we wanna see what's inside the dust. We wanna see the stars that are forming or the areas that stars are forming within this dust. And in order to do that, we can take infrared pictures. And so this is an earlier infrared telescope picture of this galaxy, which is amazing. It kind of looks like a seashell almost, but you start to see this structure that just isn't easily visible when you just look at where the stars are. Well, we've got a web image of, of this galaxy as well. And it reveals cooler stars and dusty structures and stuff that just was not visible before. So while the other picture, the dust was dark, in this picture, the dust is lit up and you can really see it. We've got another, a different galaxy showing you a side by side of of how you can go back and forth between the two. Here, notice right here over in this Hubble version, you've got this dark lane right here. That's this lit up lane right here. 
And so once you start to be able to pick out um, some of these structures, then you go, oh, I see. I see where, where this stuff was hidden before and now comes into view. This is a Hubble image. This is a different type of galaxy. So I showed you spiral galaxies. There are round galaxies called elliptical. This is an elliptical galaxy. And you can see all sorts of other galaxies around it. So this one, this one, this one, this one. These are individual stars. These are stars in our own Milky Way galaxy that we have to look past to see these other galaxies. Each of these other fuzzy galaxies, every fuzzy thing that you see in this picture is either a close by or distant galaxy. Each one of those contains tens of billions, hundreds of billions, maybe even up to a trillion stars in each one. And you're seeing just a few fuzzy things in this picture right here. But once you start to see them, they start to pop out and you really go, oh, wow. Every single one of those fuzzy things is another galaxy. Now, how do you get these galaxies? The, the way you get them is you run galaxies together. Now, galaxies usually come in groups. Here's a group right here, a group of them, uh, galaxies that are relatively close by each other. Groups of galaxies were more common in our early universe. So by studying these groups, we get to learn about um, what the early universe was a little bit more like. Here's another group, all right? And we get to learn about how galaxies form and how they change and, and how you get the, the different kinds. So when you've got two galaxies that come together, they form a round one. But sometimes you get to see them in the process of colliding. These two galaxies here were involved in a head-on collision. They passed right through each other. The dust and the gas ran into each other and this ignited more stars. The stars didn't run into each other. Space is pretty empty. So you're not gonna have stars running into each other for the most part, but the big giant gas clouds are much bigger than stars. And so those run into each other. And so you can, you can see uh, the aftermath of this collision, this collision that's still in the process of happening. And you can see the, the gravity of this one is yanking on uh, the stars in that one right there. Here's another collision in the process of happening. Now, why am I mentioning this? Well, not only galaxies came in groups in, in the past, but our Milky Way galaxy is going to collide with a nearby galaxy called Andromeda in about four-ish billion years. Um, so learning about these tells us a bit about the future of our own Milky Way and our nearby neighbor Andromeda. This is called the Cartwheel Galaxy. This is a Hubble image. And this started off as a pinwheel shaped one like our Milky Way. And the shape that you see here is a result of a high speed collision between this one and a different galaxy that occurred about 400 million years ago. Um, and Webb has recently taken a picture of this. And so there you go. You can see structures that just were not visible before. Um, the form that this galaxy will eventually take is kind of a mystery. So this snapshot gives us a sense of what's going on in the process. Um, so we want to learn about more collisions in order to uh, get a sense of, of, of what all these uh, different collisions are going to result in uh, in the future. By the way, notice all the fuzzy galaxies in the background. You can see them. That's a star in our own Milky Way right there. Here's a star off the edge here in our own Milky Way. Just about everything else in this picture is another galaxy. Now, if you saw the pictures that NASA released on July 12th, um, the next set are, is gonna look familiar. Um, but I do wanna point out that the, the pictures that Webb took have been taken before, as in these galaxies have been photographed before. And the, the picture on the right is a Hubble image combined with that of a different telescope. I'll have a better version of this picture in just a second. Um, but I wanna show you that it, taking pictures of galaxies is not brand new. We've done it for a long time. 
Um, the picture on the left is a picture of the same group uh, used in It's a Wonderful Life in 1946. And so you can see that this group of galaxies here is this group right here, kind of got a bit of a blob right there. That's that one up top here. We've got this one here is that one there. And you can sort of get a sense of this guy here is that guy there. And so photographing this group is not new. Uh, photographing using uh, Hubble. Very, very good image for this set right here. Um, these four are in a group. This one here on the left is closer to us. It's kind of line of sight. It looks like it's part of the group, but it's not. It's actually closer. However, we can take a look and see the web image here. And what you're seeing is that this galaxy here, this kind of middle guy, is smashing through the rest. Stuff is getting pulled off these other galaxies and just twisted and mangled. And that's the cool part, that you're seeing these galaxies in the process, just in the beginning stages of, of colliding with each other. Now, this galaxy up top here has a very large black hole in the center. And that black hole is actively pulling material in from the very center. Now, you can't see the black hole in this picture. It's way too small um, compared to the, the overall size of this. And we're way too far away. By the way, just notice all the fuzzy things in the background. Notice all the stuff, all the galaxies in the background. Sorry, go back to this guy. There's a, there's a black hole here. One of the remarkable things about Webb is that we have the ability to learn what the material is that stuff is made of around lots of these different things. And I'm not gonna go over this graph. What I want you to know is scientists get excited by squiggly lines on graphs. And these squiggly lines are telling us what the material around the black hole is made of. That will tell us about the processes happening around the black hole. What temperature that stuff is at, how is it moving? What is it doing? And so more to come on that, but know that we now know what the material is around that black hole, that stuff that's orbiting that giant black hole. So um, this set of squiggly lines on graphs is great. Many more, many more graphs to come in the future from data that we get from this telescope. Now this is, um, a set of Hubble images that are that are all stitched together. The original image was a little bit smaller, but this is a, a small portion of the sky. And what Hubble uh, astronomers have done is they photographed the sky. This looks like stars, but no, there are very few individual stars in this picture. Just about everything that you see in this picture is a galaxy. Each one of these fuzzy things containing Again, tens of billions, if not hundreds of billions of stars. And there are tens of thousands of galaxies in this picture. Now that, that highlighted one that you see is one of several dim red fuzzy splotches. And though that, those are very, very, very distant galaxies. When the light left this galaxy, the universe, the, so when the light left this galaxy and then eventually got here, the universe was only about 400 million years old. This light was traveling for about 13.3, 13.4 billion years to then be gathered up by the Hubble Space Telescope in order to take that picture and, and show it to you. That's pretty neat. That, that, that particular galaxy is the current Hubble record holder for the for the oldest object that Hubble was able to photograph or, or is able to photograph. Now this is a different Hubble image of a different part of the sky. Again, lots and lots of fuzzy galaxies in this picture. Hubble took almost two weeks of time to gather enough light to take this picture. And this is the web image. The web version took 12 and a half hours of time to take this picture. And there are lots of things I could point out in this picture, but what the, the thing that I really want to point out that usually gets people thinking is they've highlighted a few things, and, and I know you can't see the splotches uh, on, on in the squares, but know that in this picture, there is a little splotch right there. 
that little splotch, they've been able to study the light that comes to us from that splotch. That splotch is a distant galaxy. The light left that galaxy 11.3 billion years ago. The light left this splotch 13 billion years ago. The light left that splotch 12.6 billion years ago. The light left that splotch 13.1 billion years ago. What they're able to do is study essentially the pattern of hydrogen that they see coming from those objects. And they know that if the object was a certain distance away, the pattern would look a certain way. And, but, and because those objects are really far, the pattern looks different. And so the, the, it's the pattern that's telling us and where it is that's telling us how distant those objects actually are. Last thing I'll leave you with. There is another splotch in that picture. They've blown it up to great big size here. But that is a new found galaxy found in that web image that if it's confirmed, and it still needs to be confirmed, if it's confirmed, the light left this galaxy when the universe was only 300 million years old. The prior record was when the universe was 400 million years old. This galaxy, uh, the light left it even longer ago. And we don't think that will be the end of the, the record holding that we're going to get for distance or for, no, sorry, not for distance, for, for age, for how far, how, sorry, how long ago the light left those galaxies. This, this is just the first one. And we expect many more to come after that. Last thing before I take some questions um, and throw your questions in the chat if you if you have any if I haven't completely utterly melted every brain cell, which you know what I give this talk and I melt my own brain cells by by talking about all this because I still find it completely amazing. If you want to learn more about these uh, two missions, Hubble and Webb, they're both run by the Space Telescope Science Institute at Johns Hopkins, um, and so HubbleSite.org and webtelescope.org, and web is spelled with two Bs. So I highly recommend going to both of those places. But the uh, last thing is that, as I'll stop sharing, the last thing is that um, you actually can just go online and search latest web images. People are taking that data, processing it, and releasing it, which is totally cool to do. And so you get people, just citizen science, everyday folks like you and me, processing these pictures and releasing them to the public. They're not the, the, the prior NASA press release fancy version, but they're still pretty amazing. And so more to come on all this, possibly up to 20 years of life of this telescope that we could get this incredible amount of data uh, for now till 2042 possibly. So we'll see. All right. Questions as I grab a drink of water. Yeah, that was fantastic. Oh my gosh, I have some questions. So Please. while people are, are getting their fingers warmed up on their keyboards, um, go ahead and type that into the chat. And uh, yeah, we'd love to hear from you guys. So um, might be a, a silly question, but I think in my mind, I got it confused between like Voyager and sending something out into the solar system versus staying within like the Earth's orbit. Could you explain a little bit about the difference? Absolutely. So Hubble, for example, is an Earth orbiting telescope. And by the way, before I before I uh, finish the rest, your idea is absolutely one that lots of people have. And I think the reason for that is we see these amazing pictures how do you get a close-up picture of something? How do we normally do that? We get closer to it, right? right. So it, it makes sense we would think like that because that's our everyday, uh, our everyday um, experience. Hubble orbits Earth, takes pictures of different di distant stuff. Okay, um, it stays pointed at those objects, and it can it can move itself to to point at a different object, but it's still orbiting Earth in the process. Webb technically orbits the sun. Um, it orbits the sun about a million miles farther out. So on average, you could say Earth orbits 93 million miles from the sun-ish. 
Webb orbits about 94 million miles from the sun ish. And but Voyager is a spacecraft that's an example of something that has gone out and it went past these planets and it flew past them. Uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. And it has kept going and it is still operating, which is kind of amazing. They they don't use the cameras anymore on, on Voyager, on either of the Voyagers, because it's so dark out there. There's nothing to take a picture of. Um, and its cameras were made to uh, take pictures of bright planets, not anything out where it is, where it's cold and dark and, and all that. Um, and then you've got spacecraft that land on planets. Those are like the Mars rovers. You've got spacecraft that go into orbit around other planets. And we've got some Mars spacecraft that do that. We had we have the Juno spacecraft around Jupiter. Um, we've got uh, the uh, we've got some spacecraft that orbit the sun and study the sun. So there's there's a lot of different ways you can send something out that sometimes it stays here, sometimes it goes to a place and stays there, sometimes it goes past other things and just keeps going. Hope that helps. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Okay. Excellent. So um, I have another question and please everyone go ahead and pop anything that you have on your mind into the chat. Yep. Um, I'll just remind you guys where it is. Oh, that's right. If you if you're watching on a laptop or on, uh, then you'll see it on the toolbar at the bottom, just click the chat bubble and that'll bring up the chat window and you can type it. You can either send a question directly to us only if you only want us to see it, or you can send it where everyone can see it. So it's up to you if you want to do that. If you're watching on your phone, just press your top, tap your screen and the icons for chat and, and other things should come up as well. So sorry, go ahead. Oh, thank you. No, that's perfect. All right. So um, now that we're discovering all these new things that we didn't get to see before, is there like a naming system that's just sort of like letters and numbers or do people actually get to name things? Both. So it depends on what it is. Um, if it's a comet, if it's an icy thing that orbits the sun and all that, if it's a brand new comet, it's named for the person who discovers it. If it's an asteroid, which is a rocky thing that may have some ice in it or not, uh, the person who discovers it can name it, but he or she or they can't name it after themselves. Don't ask me why. I, I They came up with that convention long ago and just stuck with it. I think that's kind of stupid personally, but that's my own view. Um, not necessarily that of my employer or anything like that. Um, for planets in our own solar system, if it's like a new moon that's discovered, there already is a convention of uh, what to name moons around planets, like um, uh, moons of Uranus are named for characters in Shakespeare's plays. Names of Saturn's moons were originally named for titans, you know, the titans in Greek mythology, but then they ran out of titans. And they even called one of them Titan. And they still ran out of names because I think there's only 12 Titans. So they had to pick other characters as well. Um, and But if it's planets around other stars, they're often named for, or they're usually named for the telescope or the survey that found them. And they're named initially for the star. So the star might be part of a catalog and it might just be some numbers and stuff that indicate like where it is or something like that. And then if it's a planet found around that star, the first planet that's found is given the small letter B. So let's pretend the name of the star is JX2 XK1. I just made that up. And then if there's a, a planet found around that star, it would be blah, 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 B. And then the next one is blah, 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 C, and then D, and then so on. And yes, I have had a dozen people try to explain to me why they didn't start with the letter A. And I still think it's dumb. And I don't know why they didn't start with the little letter A. <laughs> they say, but little letter A means this and that. I'm like, that's okay. Letters can mean different things, right? So anyway, whatever. Um, that's okay. just me. Well, Michelle, I think you did blow people's minds. I think I did. I think or I melted. did. Our brains okay. are 
Um, but hey, listen, everyone that's still with us, uh, we do have her scheduled again. Um, she's going to be back on Monday, March 13. So we're going to go through a whole winter season without you, but we'll come back and see you again in the spring. Um, her topic is another brain twister, um, defining time. So this is a new one for you. I'm really excited mm -hmm. to hear about defining time. Yep. I'm going to do that one for the first time um, in a few weeks. It's a, it's a brand new one. And I had a lot of fun putting that one together. It's about how we've, um, uh, how we've used objects to help us define time. How we, where did, where did some of these concepts come from and um, how we have needed this concept of time to help us explore planet earth. And, and it's, it was really, it's, it's a lot of history related stuff. Oh, we um, love history. That's great. Yeah. It's mostly a history talk. Um, oh, cool. So yeah. Yeah. I had, I had fun doing that one. And um, so yeah, looking forward to that. All right. So, great. Yeah. So yeah, Monday, March 13th, we'll have you back then. Thank Excellent. you. Again. Thank you again. This was wonderful. Thank All you right. everybody. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye.